But now I'd like to draw your attention. If you have a Bible, I think you'll find it helpful. If you want to follow in your Bible, Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. If uh, you don't have a Bible, we're going to have it up on the screen up here. Uh, if you don't own a Bible, can I say again, we say this often, uh, please, before you leave here today, just let us know because we have Bibles out at the Welcome Center. We would love to give you one to keep as your own. Um, we just want to get God's Word out there. We think it's powerful uh, as God speaks to us through it, and so uh, we'd love to give you a Bible if you need one. Uh, otherwise, follow along here. I have to give you, though, some context because um, I've said this before. When you're reading your Bible, make sure that you and your own personal devotions realize and remember that chapter divisions in the Bible are sometimes a little random. Um, they aren't, weren't, weren't part of the original text. We put them in there so we can find places in the Bible more easily. But this is a classic example because what happens right before chapter 20, the end of chapter 19, is actually tied to everything we're going to read today. So let me just give you a quick summary of what that's about. Jesus is teaching with his disciples, and a young man approaches him who's wealthy. And this young, rich man asks Jesus a very specific question. He says to Jesus, Jesus, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? That's actually fairly significant that he puts it in terms of what do I got to do to get eternal life? And Jesus begins to talk with the young man, and the young man's pretty confident that he's a, a good guy. Not perfect, but I've, I've really kept the commandments. I've done, I'm a pretty moral person. And Jesus says, well, how about this? Why don't you sell everything that you own, which is a lot, you're wealthy, and give all of that to the poor, and then come and follow me. And in that case, the young man, it says, walks away sadly. He can't do it. That's, that's asking too much, Jesus, to give up my wealth, to give up the things that I found security in, identity in, and, and hand it over so that I can follow you. He can't do it. Jesus is sad, too. He sees the young man walk away, and he says to his disciples, he said, it is so hard for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. As soon as he says that, the disciples are blown away because their theology is if you're rich, if you're wealthy, it is a sign that God says you're okay, that God has blessed you, that you are, in fact, spiritual, more close to God than people who don't have wealth. Now, that's not the truth of the Scriptures, but that's what they believed, and Jesus undoes that, and he says, well, think about this. It's not only just hard, it's actually impossible. It's impossible for human beings just to be good enough and to reach for God and to earn their salvation. You can't do it, but with God, it's possible. Just by yourselves, it's not possible. Peter picks up on this, and he says, hey, wait a second, Jesus. We left everything to follow you. I had a pretty good fishing business in Galilee. I left that completely. I left my family, and I'm following. We've left everything for you. What are we going to get? If, if giving up all of that, is, it's kind of impossible. It takes God's intervention. What are we going to get for having given up all of that? And then Jesus says, well, Peter, you're, you're going to be blessed if you're in me, but be careful because what's going on in your heart right now, Peter, I want to reveal with this parable, this story. Let's read it, Matthew 20, 1 through 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard, and he agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. And about nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. And he told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I'll pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. And he asked them, why have you been standing around here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. And he said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. And the workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. 
but each one of them also received a denarius. And when they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I'm not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I'm generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. Let's pray just for a moment. We're grateful for your word, Lord, but we ask for your help because uh, we don't have the wisdom. Um, we don't have the insight just to uh, read on our own and to take it in and make it uh, something life-changing. We need you for that. But we do present ourselves. Help us to clear our minds and our hearts so that uh, you have all of us in this time and that as you speak to us, we can hear and then fully respond in our lives. Help us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, way to be on mission, church. Um, honestly, it, it's a privilege for me because, you know, we're in this, we started this series last week. We're talking about um, uh, naming your sin as the beginning of healing, um, that when we're able to identify these areas of our lives where we're not really loving God, loving people, and even loving ourselves the way that God wants us to, uh, that's sin. And trying to actually change, have this transformation take place in our lives, we know it's critical that we actually name it. It's critical that we're actually able to say, God, I just will not going to try harder tomorrow, but I'm also going to know exactly where I'm trying. And this area of sin, God, whatever these sins are. So this series, we're talking about the seven deadly sins. That's what one way that they're often referred to. But the goal behind them is that we see them in everyday life and way to be on mission because I'm so privileged that you guys come to me and then you share with me. We talked about pride last week and how you come in and you're, man, Cliff, this is, this is what's going on in my life right now. And I, I just want to make sure, help me to see, is pride active in what I'm doing here? Is pride active in my response in this situation? I mean, this is these are the kinds of questions you don't ask unless the Holy Spirit is actually doing something, stirring you from the inside out. So I just want to encourage you. This is hard stuff, but at the same time, it's the stuff that we find our real freedom. Real transformed life happens for people who, it's not that you don't sin, but that you are regularly confessing your sin and saying, God, by the Holy Spirit, can you change me a little bit more away from that particular sin. So last week we started with pride. Um, today we're going to look at envy. Uh, it's mentioned in our text at the very end, um, talking about envy, but here's, I want to give you just kind of a, a starter for envy here. And Proverbs 14.30 tells us, a heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. Very vivid image here that envy is this kind of internal thing. If I want to put a definition on it just to kind of get started uh, today. Envy is the sin of wishing that my life were different. And especially, envy gets prompted when I start comparing my life to others. That envy is this discontent. It's a dissatisfaction, but it's primarily prompted because I look at someone else's life and I say, why can't my life be like that? Why not me, God? And that phrase that you hear, the grass is always greener on the other side, that's envy. That's envy saying, yeah, well, my life is always, always brown and kind of dried out. Somebody else's life seems to be thriving. Why can't that be my life? So envy is this sin of wishing, and then I would add to this fantasizing. We begin to have these kind of fantasies in my mind of what it would be like if my life were like this. And many times we find ourselves living in our fantasies more than in our realities. So envy has this ability to kind of move us with a discontent, but it, it doesn't go very far. It sits. It, it rots in the bones. Um, it's interesting, when you look at these, these kind of deadly sins that we talk about, all sin is deadly. 
These sins just happen to be the ones that we see more regularly, and they are at the root of so many of our problems. But some of the other sins you can look at, like lust um, or gluttony, um, and a lot of those sins, there's this weird dynamic where you can actually enjoy, there's a moment of enjoyment of that sin for a season, and before you really suffer the consequences or before it kind of catches up with you. So lust, there's kind of this, well, you can actually enjoy lust for a little bit, and then, of course, the consequences tear your life apart. You can enjoy uh, a moment of self-indulgent gluttony, but then inevitably, you know, uh, it, it comes down later. The consequences really make you miserable. But envy is the one sin, somebody has said, that is absolutely no fun. From the very beginning, it just brings a discontent, but it doesn't go anywhere, and it sits inside you, and it eats you up. And envy has really almost no pleasure to it. Envy, however, is, it doesn't really go anywhere, but it moves us. It really moves us in all kinds of ways. If you were looking at our world, half of our advertising is based on envy, pretty much. I mean, pretty much, what are they trying to do? They're trying to give you a picture of what your life is not he, they're trying to say, look, look at this. You want skin like this, don't you? You, you want, you're, now look at your skin. And you're like, my skin doesn't look like that. Well, nobody's does because they've airbrushed everything there. But there's the picture. You want to have skin like this? Buy this product and your life will be out of the discontent of what you don't have to something else. Hey, you want to be a real man, don't you? Well, look at this guy. This guy's a real man, chiseled like out of a mountain or something. And, and look at this guy. What makes him a real man, though, is look at his truck. Look at this guy's truck. And you're looking at his truck, and, and then you start looking at your truck, and you're like, my truck looks nothing like this. Tr this brand-new truck looks fantastic. And, of course, inside you there's this sense that's trying to be kind of irritated. The envy's trying to be used here to say, but you could be a real man if you had this truck. Your life could be better if you had these products. Half of all our advertising is in some way motivated by envy because it's always putting the comparisons. Half of every post on Facebook would go away if we didn't have envy because what are we doing? We're comparing lies and, oh, they got more likes than I did and so we're working hard to kind of get some kind of affirmation. Envy is so prevalent that we miss it. It's kind of so obvious that it's just like, well, that's just kind of the way life is. God has made it clear, oh, I've got real life for you. You have been living under the worst of what life can be. What if life could be different? God says, I can make that happen. It's impossible just by yourself, but I can make this change happen. But I've got to come to grips with envy. It's just an interesting thing about envy. They say in U.S. News and World Report, they did this little thing where they talked with people who made about $25,000 a year. And they said to them, look, the American dream, you're supposed to have what you really are, you consider to be a good life. What would it take for you in your current situation, what would it take to get you to that point where you felt like you had the American dream? And they talked about all kinds of different things. They basically said, you know what, if they were making about $54,000 a year instead of twenty-five, they would have it. They asked people who were making about fifty dollars to $55,000 a year, what would it take for you? take about $104,000 for them to experience that fulfillment of, no, I real, now my life is really set. They asked people who were making $100,000, what would it take? No kidding, about $200,000. It seems that that kind of satisfaction is always twice away from where we're at. It doesn't really matter where you are. I say that because don't think that envy is just relegated to people who are at the bottom economically who are at the bottom in terms of athletics, who are at the bottom in terms of whatever measures you want to throw in life, even the people who seem to have it all have envy because there's always a sense that it's just not quite enough. That's the false promise of envy. Do you get, if you're thinking, well, Cliff, I don't really envy people, you know, maybe you're not, maybe you're one of the few people out there today who's not looking up here and saying, oh, if only I could have a receding hairline like Pastor Cliff, you know. <laughs> If, if only I could have a nose that's so prominent, you know, if only I could have that. Maybe you're like, Cliff, I don't really look at people that way. That's not really a problem for me. Okay, granted, I could, that's one form of envy. Here's another form. Do you ever get upset when somebody gets what they don't deserve? Does that ever just kind of irk you? Does that kind of, hey, that's, Cliff, that's not about envy. That's just about fairness. Well, does Jesus have a story for us? 
Jesus has this parable that we've just read, and if it doesn't strike you in some way, I, I'm not sure you're really being honest. Every time we read this text, it bothers us. There's a part of us that says, it's not right. I'm telling you, it's not fair. You can't have a guy who works one hour get paid the same amount as a guy who works 12 hours. It's not fair under any standard, under any system. Something is drastically wrong. Why would Jesus purposely, it's a story, he makes it purposely this way, to get a rise out of us. I think it's because Jesus loves us enough to say, you know what, this sin that's in you is poison. Poisons your relationship with God, destroys your relationship with people. By the way, we said that with pride. Pride puts us in competition, and so that's why we don't love people like we should, because I'm looking to get from you. I'm trying to create my own life, what only God can really give me, or you're an obstacle for me to get what I really want, and so our relationships really get messed up. Envy is when you're losing that competition. Pride is the competition. Envy is when you're losing it. It feels like everybody else is getting better than you, better than they maybe deserve. Let me look at these three things Jesus brings to the surface, our envy in these ways. First is this. Let me ask you these questions because Jesus puts these in questions. Do you see life primarily as a gift or do you see life primarily as something that you earn, that you make? A gift or something we earn? Jesus says, here's a story. Kingdom of Heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. You guys all get this. This is perfect for where we live because it's harvest. It just happens to be harvest for a vineyard, but it's the same concept. You know what happens. Harvest comes. Some of you guys who don't work you know, on farms, you're working during harvest. You're driving trucks. You're, you're doing all kinds of things because when harvest comes, you need every, every available worker that you can to bring it in in a certain amount of time. Same deal here. In Jesus' day, the way they did it, though, was instead of knowing who you were going to call, you would have people gather in the marketplace. And landowners would come in, farmers would come in and say, I need X number of guys to work my field. How about you? How about you? How about you? And the guys who were in the marketplace were your available employment. And so Jesus says that's the deal. People who are there at 6 o'clock in the morning, he gives time frames on all this, the work day for them, 6 in the morning till 6 in the evening. They, they don't have any tractors with lights on, so they don't have any possibility of working past the sun going down. 6 in the morning to 6 in the evening, 12-hour days. Guys who are there at 6 o'clock in the morning in the marketplace, what kind of workers do you think these guys are? These are responsible guys. These are your hardest working guys. Why? Because they are saying, I'm there as soon as I can start working. I want to be there. They show up in the marketplace. But the interesting thing, and notice this in the text, that there's one difference, huge difference, between the, sh the workers at 6 o'clock who start and all the other workers who show up later. And the biggest difference is this. I don't know if you caught it in the text. Here in verse 2, he, the landowner, agreed to pay them, these earliest workers at 6 o'clock in the morning, a denarius for the day. And he sent them into the vineyard. Like Cliff, well, that sounds, a denarius, by the way, is the common wage for a whole day's work. That was fair. Everybody recognized that. The funny thing here is that it's the workers who actually put the condition, they put the contract out to the landowner. They're the ones because it's the landowner who agrees. So in other words, they approach him and they said, we'll come work for you. We're hard workers. You can tell. We're up early. We're ready to go. But it's going to cost you. Normal wage. I'm not asking for more. Give me a denarius. I'll work for you all day long. And they put the conditions to the landowner. This is, in, this is significant because none of the other workers do this. All of the other workers, it says, when they show up and they come up later, they're not as easy, easy out of, you know, they're not first out of bed. When they ask the landowner, they agree, it says, you'll pay us whatever is right. I'll pay you whatever's right is what the landowner says. And they agree to it. Now, that's pretty radical. If you're not sure it is, then you can do this tomorrow. Try this. This will be a great way to remember this text. You go into work tomorrow, talk to your boss, say, look, I, I know that we got this deal that you pay me X number of dollars per hour or that you pay me by a salary. Let's scrap that. Tomorrow, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to show up for work on time. I'm not going to kind of scrimp on my time. I'm going to be there all the way for the full work day. And then your boss says, so what should I pay you? And you say to him, I, you pay me whatever's right. Just go ahead. 
I don't even, you don't even have to tell me what it is. You just pay me whatever is right. Now, most people are saying, that's crazy. You don't do that, Cliff. Why? It's pretty risky. If I start to put my trust in this person, if it's not a great boss, if it's not a great owner, well, he's going to take advantage of me. My goodness, he griped when I asked for a raise last time. What's he going to do now? He's going to chop that out. He's going he's to give me the bare minimum. I'm not sure I can trust. So you ask this question, why in the world would the first group of workers, and it kind of has some leverage here, first ones in the morning, say, here's the contract. You've got to agree to it. And the rest of them would say, hey, that's fine. Whatever you say is right. Whatever you want to pay us, we're happy to. And the only thing I can think of is this, desperation. Here's the thing we know about day workers in Jesus' time. They didn't have savings. They didn't go through a period where they could say, well, I hope I, f I get picked up. They pretty much worked day to day. Talk about living from paycheck to paycheck. These guys went into the day saying, if I get hired today, I'm going to the marketplace. If a landowner picks me up, then tonight I eat. Tonight my family eats. If not we got nothing. We got to go another whole day and hope I get work the next day so that we can eat. I guarantee you, as workers are showing up later, and most of the workers have already been taken by the owners early, there's a bit of desperation that starts to arise here where they're like, hey, you pay me whatever you think is right because something's better than nothing. If I go home tonight, we got, I've got no work at all, we got nothing. If you even pay me just a, a pittance of what a normal day's work would be because I'm showing up late, I'd be happy for that. That's actually pretty critical in assessing where our own heart is at. And I think this is why Jesus is speaking this parable to his followers, not to the Pharisees, not to the bad guys in the Bible. These are the good guys, his disciples. And he's saying, fellas, be aware of envy in this form. You can start to look at life as pretty much something you've earned, even life with me. Peter and the other disciples were the first to start following Jesus. Some of you have grown up in the church. You can't remember a time you weren't in the church. It's like, that's, that's all I remember as a kid. We went to church. I went to Sunday school. I did, we were involved in church my whole life long. That's a blessing. But here's the danger. The longer you walk with Jesus, we forget our desperation. We, we get pretty sure of ourselves. We feel like, well, yeah, I know I'm saved by grace, but you know what? I work hard to get here to worship regularly. I, I work hard on my devotional time. I don't always feel like doing it, but I'm a hard-working person, and there's a sense that life becomes what I make of it. I've earned what I get. I, in fact, a lot of us, we don't want what we haven't earned. You ever have that? Somebody tries to give you a gift? Oh, no, 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 no. I don't deserve that. When life becomes what I've earned, it changes our hearts. It actually changes the way that we think and what we believe in a particular way. And don't get me wrong here if you're thinking, Cliff, are you speaking against a work ethic? No, not at all. I love being in the Midwest. You know why? You guys work like dogs. You, you work harder than anybody in any other place we've ever lived. I've lived from the East Coast all the way to here. I'm telling you, there's something about Midwesterners, maybe it's the, the agricultural thing, but you guys work hard. I've seen it, it's funny, on mission trips, uh, when I first was in ministry, I took kids that, and they were great kids, but they were suburban kids. First mission trip I ever went on with BFCC and we had youth down there, I'm like, oh my word, what are they hopped up on? What are these guys jacked up on? Because they never stopped, they were working, they're like, oh, this is easy compared to farm work, you know? I mean, this is nothing, and they are working like crazy. It's like great work ethic. Are you saying that that's not where we should be? No, the Bible actually affirms a strong work ethic. There were Christians in the city of Thessalonica who when they first received Christ said, great, I'm going to quit my job because I think Jesus is probably coming back soon. And Paul rebukes them. He says, look, you're a Christian. You ought to be a hard worker. In fact, if you're not working, don't sponge off of people. Those who don't work, don't eat, he says. That's in the Bible. In the Thessalonians, so the Bible affirms a strong work ethic. Don't let your work ethic, though, define you. Don't let your work ethic become the way that your heart sees the world in which you live primarily. Some of you are like, 
Cliff, I got a strong work ethic. I'm, I think I've, I've made myself what I am to a certain extent. I had to put a lot of effort in to get where I'm at in life. I don't doubt that one second. But here's the thing. Let me just change one detail of your life and I guarantee your life would look entirely different than it looks now. You get to stay as smart as you are. You guys are smart as a whip. You get to keep your intelligence. You get to keep your personality. You get to keep your work ethic. Everything about you, you get to keep. And here I'm going to change one detail of your life that will radically alter the way your life looks. Instead of being born where you were born, here's the detail change. You're born in Niger, central um, uh, country in Central Africa. You're still as smart as you ever were. Your DNA is still the same in terms of your intelligence and your ability to grasp. But guess what? You can't read because over 75% of the country in Niger is illiterate. No one is able to teach you how to read even though you still are as smart as ever. You still have a work ethic that is phenomenal. Show me how I will make a way to make a living. And your work ethic is the same. But the difference is now... You've worked and invested yourself into your farm, but now, and the Sahara Desert, by the way, covers 80% of Niger. Most people don't know that it's actually still spreading. And farmers who have built their livelihood and worked hard to create their farm like you would if you were born there, now find that their farm is overrun by the Sahara Desert. And you've got to pick up your family and try to find some other place to try to make a living. Your work ethics is the same. Your intelligence is the same. But you see how one little thing that none of us has control over, not one of us gets to pick where we're born. Not one. I mean, would anybody be born in New Jersey if they could pick where they're going to be? Nobody would be, we'd say, no, I want to be born here, and this is a, we are so blessed. We have no idea. We take it for granted that I made my life when if I changed just that one detail, your life would look radically different because you'd be living on less than one dollar a day all because of where you're born. Is life something I've earned? Or is there so much gifted that God has given me that I don't deserve, I didn't earn? This is a first part for us to really wrestle with. Second is this. Here's the question. Is a person's worth determined by our actions or by God's? Envy is about self-worth. So I look at someone else, I'm unhappy because not only they have something, but it seems to me their worth, their value is enhanced by that in some way that mine's not. So it's about self-worth. We sometimes try, you know envy's happening when this happens. You ever get to this thing, well, I may not be as wealthy as this guy over here. This person just won the lottery. This person's been wealthy because they had a windfall. But, but I'm glad I don't have their problems. You, you ever say that sometimes? We, we kind of console ourselves by, by saying, it's, it would just be a mess anyway. You know, I, I wouldn't, that money, I, w I don't even need that kind of money. And all along, what we're really saying, I would really love to have that money. I can't have it, so it's sort of like the fox in Aesop's tale. The grapes I can't reach are sour. They're, they're sour anyway. I, I wouldn't want anything to do with that. Envy is trying to hide itself here when we get into that mode, and it's really about our worth. What, what is my worth about? I, I'll share this, and I'm not... Um, I'm not proud of this at all, but here's something. There's a, there's a particular joy that I have, Dave and Pastor Eric as well. As pastors, we get to help people because as part of the ministerial association, churches have gotten together and generous people like you give money to the food pantry, but also for help for people who are in emergency situations need help with rent or with their gas bill or their city bill, and we're able to help them. It's just a huge blessing. We just get to be the outlet of it. But some people will come and we'll be like, they, they are just broken. I don't know what I'm going to do. I, 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 I hate asking for help, but I've been told that maybe you guys can help. And we, we help. It's fantastic. But I also have to tell you, there's a part of that that's a struggle because there are people that try to see the system and take advantage of the system. Hey, they're giving some free help out. Maybe I can work people in such a way to get what I want. There are people that do that. I had one, this was one time that uh, somebody came and they, they told me they needed some help. We helped them. We helped them again. We helped them up to a certain limit. We put limits so that we can help everybody, not just one or two people. They reached that limit. They asked for some more help. I said, I'm sorry, we, you know, we've, we've helped all that we are able to. And then I found out, like a couple days later, 
that this latest story that they told me was an absolute lie. Just absolutely lied to my face so that they could try to get some financial help for something. And I'll tell you, it really torqued me. It really ticked me off. I mean, there's just something about that that just rubbed me the wrong way. And, and I'm not proud of this, but I, I very distinctly remember I, I was just mad. And in my, I don't know if I even said it out loud because I was by myself, but I remember clearly in my thoughts, I said, you know, this person is worthless. And almost immediately, the Holy Spirit, and I don't always hear God this clearly, but the Holy Spirit immediately, not no time passed whatsoever, immediately said to me, don't ever call someone worthless that I died for. Ever. Yeah, but, but God, they, they lied. They're trying to scam people. They're trying to take advantage. I never said that what they're doing is right, God says. You were right not to try to offer more help in that situation. But don't ever mistake a person's actions for their worth. Do you see how easily those two kind of get mixed together? We start basing our life off of what I've done, what I've accomplished. I'm good at this. I'm a hard worker. I've earned certain things. And our worth is trying to be drawn from it. And conversely, when people really mess up, we say, oh, well, they're a screw up. They're worthless. They're no good. And God says, don't ever, ever bring those two and cross them because here's the truth. No matter how bad you've done, no matter how much you've messed up, here is a God who says as clear as he can possibly say it on a cross in public, this is how much you're worth, that I'm willing to send my son to die on the cross for you. And you think that your worth is tied up in what you do. It's tied up in completely in what God has done and is doing. Don't mix it. Envy will bring those two together so fast and say a person's worth is related to what they have done, the things that they have done, and it's not true. Lastly, this. Last, last third question here. Do you believe that God is both good and just? Because here's the thing. Envy seems to be about me and someone else. I'm mad at them. They're getting what they don't deserve. It's not fair. It's not right. I don't feel good about that. I wish my life were better. And it's not really primarily about you and someone else. You know what? The core of envy is you're mad at God. You're, you're mad at God. You're upset because in our hearts we say, God, ultimately, you're all-powerful. You're all-knowing. You're the God who is sovereign over all you could do something different, and you're not. And ultimately, envy is saying, my ultimate dissatisfaction is with you, God, because of the way that you're letting my life go. So envy, if we really want to get to it, we're going to have to face this hard reality. Jesus makes it easier for us in this parable because he says, the workers who've drawn their self-worth because they're such good workers and they, they've kind of limited the grace that they receive because they, I don't want anything I haven't earned. That's what we do. We limit the grace that we can receive when it's all about earning. And they finally confront the owner, but the owner confronts them back by saying, are you envious because I'm generous? You know what that, the literal phrase there means? Do you have an evil eye because I'm good? That's what the phrase literally means. You know what the evil eye is? You know, the evil eye, they say, is, it's that eye that can only see bad. It's the eye that when I look at someone's life and I'm envious, all I can do is see everything bad, nothing good. And God says, is that what's happening? Your eye is so bad that it actually looks at me, the good creator of all things, and wonders, questions. I'm not so sure that God is perfectly good because he says he has a plan for my life. Well, God, if this is your plan, I think it stinks. I don't like it. I think it's a horrible plan. It's funny, I, you know, my dad passed away a while ago now, but before he did, my dad loved to play golf. He was, he was an okay golfer. I'm not a good golfer at all, but I loved when we'd go back to Pennsylvania, visit with him. I got a chance to go out with my dad, and I loved it just because we got to be together. We got to talk, and I was like, this will be great. We can talk together as we go walk in the fairways, in theory, that sounds good, but the problem was my dad was a left-handed golfer. 
I was a right-handed golfer, and we had both mastered a tremendous slice uh, to our shots. And so what would happen is my dad would tee off, and he would tee off, and his slice would go way over into the other fairway, uh, the, the, the hole next to us. I would slice the opposite way. So we'd talk at the, at the tee, and we'd talk at the green. But in between, we never saw each other because we're off in different fairways. We're finding our balls. We're hacking away. We get up to the green. We finally put in. Dad turns to me and he says, Cliff, what do I mark you down for? Now, I know I'm a pastor, but I'm just telling you, there's this moment because I was counting, and yes, I, it took me eight. You know, what I need to tell my dad is put me down for an eight. And, and, but there's a part of me that's like, but that sounds really bad. I mean, I, I'm not a good golfer, but I, how, what if I just said six? Besides, that one was sort of like a practice swing anyway. I wasn't really trying to. So I, maybe I'd just say a six. And, and in that moment, of course, there's, here's the Holy Spirit. He's with us everywhere. And he's kind of, you know, convicting me. He's thinking, really? You're going you're gonna to question? You're going to throw away your integrity, Cliff, for a little stupid game of golf with your dad? I mean, you're really going to do that? So then I turned to dad and I said, no, go ahead, put me down for a four, I said. Because <laughs> in your mind, you're thinking, yeah, you got to be good, but in that little, does that really, really matter? The problem with that is we start looking at God that way and we think God is good, maybe just not here. And this here part is my life. And this here part is this part of my, my, the plan of my life that seems to have gone so astray and is painful. And maybe God is good, but maybe not completely. And here, the, the owner is just absolutely confronting them and saying, do you have the evil eye? Can you only see bad such that even now when you look at me in relationship to me that you see bad in me? You don't see that I'm really good. You see my generosity as a fault. This is the question that we have to ask ourselves for envy. There's only one way to deal with envy. You can't fight it by just trying not to be. You have to be on the positive side. You have to say, so that what means I have to reestablish. This is why worship is so important. This is why prayer with other people is so important. Reading your scriptures, those spiritual disciplines, because we can't hear it enough that God is thoroughly good. That God loves you. That he'll never leave you. Can I read this for you? But read it and hear it in such a way that you hear it God say to you personally. This is a paraphrase from Isaiah 43. Imagine if you heard an audible voice, if it can't be audible, but just listen for God saying this directly into your life, using your name. And he says, I created you. I formed you. I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. When you're in over your head, I'm going to be there. When you're in rough waters, you will not go down. When you're between a rock and a hard place, it won't be a dead end. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One, your Savior. I paid a huge price for you. That's how much you mean to me. That's how much I love you. So don't be afraid. I am with you. That's how you fight envy. Because in our hearts to reestablish, is that really the way that God sees me? If so, that is the greatest treasure of your life. I mean, if that sinks for real into your mind and into your heart, nothing else compares to that kind of love. And once that love is established, we can say, God, you may have Work differently in my life. You didn't give me everything I necessarily wanted, but I thank you for that because you are always good. You reaffirm for me over and over again, I love you, I care about you, you have great value and worth to me, I will never leave you. Can you trust me, he says, to do what is right or will you demand some kind of contract with God? Oh, I pray God frees us from envy and we, we learn again how powerful this love is when you really experience it. Let's pray.